Hello and welcome back to the Cartoonist Kayfabe Courtroom. I'm Jim Rugg. My name is Ed Piskor. And today we're going to look at testimony from Jim Shooter from the uh, Fleischer versus Comics Journal uh, round of, of hearings. And, uh, and we'll give some intro into that before we actually start reading it. But uh, before we do, Ed, give them a, an update on what you're working on. So the Red Room uh, Anti-Social Network trade paperback is in stores at this very moment. It's going quick. We have a paper shortage that is preventing uh, reprints from happening kind of anytime soon. So if you see this book on the stands, you got to get your hands on it. So with that paper shor shortage in mind, uh, Red Room trigger warnings got pushed back six weeks, man. That's that's how backed up the print houses are. This is the standard cover for Red Room trigger warnings, number one, that was going to come out in mid uh, in mid-December, probably like this this Wednesday, but got pushed back to February. I don't have a firm date on that. Uh, all these stories are still self-contained. You see the cover for the regular man. Here's the Peach Pomoko uh, variant. There's the Jimmy Rugg, Zap Comics Zero variant cover. And then I had uh, just a more kind of like book covery kind of cover that I did as a retail incentive. Get these comics put on your pull list. Uh, because of the ransomware attack, I think that... Uh, stores were unable to order uh, the final amounts before we locked it in. For whatever reason, the old system they use, man, like these orders are locked and loaded. So uh, this is going to be a scarce number one. It's going to go quick and, uh, you know, it's going to have some value to it. I think, Jimmy, what you got? Everybody can join me on patreon.com slash Jim Rugg, where you can see uh, original art. You can download out of print zines and mini comics. And more importantly, you can follow along as I am working on my next book, which has been announced. That is the Hulk Grand Design. And a uh, couple of pieces that I drew this weekend for table of contents pages to give everybody some idea of uh, how that's progressing. The book is done. It'll be in stores in March. But uh, you can start telling your retailer about it now so that they can make sure they order enough copies of it. So that is Hulk Grand Design. Man, I'm super psyched to be uh, wrapping that up and showing that off. So expect to see a lot of artwork from me on my social media, on my Patreon, and uh, in the coming months. I'm suspecting we're going to be seeing a lot of Hulk centric episodes of uh cartoonist <laughs> kayfabe in the coming months good congratulations on that Jimmy. This, very, this, very much. these boxes are all hulk comics right here so we would definitely be pulling out some of some of my favorites over these uh these coming months so jimmy we, we did the uh the neil gaiman todd mcfarland uh deposition uh from 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 2002 and first off kayfabe has been on the mind uh with this impending Hawaii trip, we just wrapped up a bunch of videos. We're recording a gang of videos ahead of time to make sure that we can play one a day. Uh, I th I'm proposing that we schedule them uh, ahead of time, just in case if uh, like some Richie Valance, Buddy Holly, Big Bopper gimmick happens. Wrong direction, Ed. Wrong direction. <laughs> but dude, we're just going to Virgil parch the site. Like, <laughs> like, the, like there will still be videos even if uh if it's the day the kayfabe died or something like that that, that might be my favorite kayfabe comment i've ever heard you make <laughs> go to virgil parts the gimmick that's right <laughs> <laughs> so dude i uh you know i'm filled with anxiety i took a melatonin last night man and uh melatonin gives me crazy dreams jim i had a dream that we recorded we were recording the todd mcfarland deposition with Todd McFarlane, and he was playing his part, but he was being a dickhead and moving away from the mic too much. And if it was an unusable recording, like that was my nightmare. These are the nightmares that I have, Jimmy. That is dedication, as So I was thinking, like, let's let's flip the script and not do the Todd McFarlane deposition because I can't have him living rent free in my head uh, for too long. Let's flip the script. People were suggesting a lot of uh, depositions and testimony that that is uh, out there, sort of in the public domain. I, uh, we got hold of a uh, comics journal 115 with that fantastic Don Simpson cover where Don Simpson's drawing the uh, under oath Jim Shooter looking like a big old Frankenstein sur surrounded with a bunch of cool independent uh, co co uh, comic book characters and stuff. And uh, can I give a little preamble to the case that, that we're going to be talking about? Do you, do you have uh, some, some, some knowledge on the joint? No, um, I mean, I have a tiny bit, but yes, Ed, please give us an intro to uh, give some context for, you know, what, what we're going to read here. So there was an interview with Gary Groth and Harlan Ellison. That was fantastic. You and I are going to unpack that one, but that might be a that might be a two part episode because the interview is about 60 pages, I think, man. Uh, and Harlan Ellison, highly opinionated fella, rest in peace, by the way, highly opinionated fella and isn't 
isn't afraid to speak his mind, uh, he would be saying stuff in there like, you know, oh, Jerry Conway, that guy, he just can get the work in on time. That's his function. It's not about quality, blah, 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 blah. And he'll just say that stuff. And then uh, he would talk about this Michael Fleischer dude over at DC. And this is well before uh, there's a such thing as the Streisand effect out there, man, uh, because Fleischer did not hurt it, it help his case uh, with people my age and stuff like that. Because every time I dig in the quarter bins, I take a look and I see his name on stuff. And I'm like, oh, he's that crazy guy. Uh, because what happened in that interview, Harlan Ellison is just speaking, speaking from 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 the hip, you know, and, and is saying stuff like, oh, this guy's a lunatic. This guy's crazy as a bed bug. And he says it multiple times, uh, which the more you say that kind of stuff, like I could, I could kind of see Fleischer's point, like, yo, th like there's no, there's no uh, opportunity to, to rebut this stuff. And you're saying that I'm crazy a lot of times, like people really might start believing it. And you and I probably would think that uh, Ellison would do this interview it would have like whatever traction it has for a month or two, but fucking this Fleischer guy brings about a case against uh, Fantagraphics, but not before he sends them uh, testimony, like by, by way, well, not testimony, but he sends them letters and stuff by way of his lawyer uh, with the things that he would like. He would like retractions on a lot of stuff. Uh, Fleischer had a, had a novel out and, and uh, the way, Harlan Ellison would describe it was like these guys set a lady on fire and then she gives them a blow job for for payment like this guy's crazy as a bed bug stuff like that uh when Fleischer sends the the letter to um Fantagraphics saying that you're mischaracterizing my novel yada 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 in this very issue 115 of the comics journal like there's a breakdown before these character witness testimonies and stuff and uh Fleischer also penned a letter that he wanted to be printed verbatim that was an apology letter from Fantagraphics so he penned it himself like through his own lawyers and it was all this stuff with retractions and it was really like if, if Fantagraphics would have done that they would have like set the most fucked up precedent for their magazine man because now every douchebag is going to come in with their own you know letters for, of apology and things whenever Fanta criticizes them. So of course Gary and Kim had to hold firm, and this 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 case went to battle. One of the pieces in that letter, uh, I believe, was paragraph three, was about that novel, and and the guys at Fantagraphics at the end they they uh, sort of give their version of of you know th the book or their review of it, and what actually did happen in the book was the bad guys got a blowjob from the lady before they doused her in gasoline and set her on fire so so that's that's the difference there anyhow man uh the comic industry was divided like comics journal highly controversial very opinionated uh one of the lone voices of kind of comics criticism and stuff so so if they give you a good cosign you're probably going to sell some comics if they gave you a bad one you know you might be laughed at for a couple of months so yeah let, let me add to that too because I, I was reading the comics journal mid to late nineties. I start reading it. And at that point it had already mellowed quite a bit, uh, maybe moved more towards the academic side of, of uh, comics criticism, as opposed to just burning the industry to the ground. Um, recently on the comic, on the uh, cartoonist kayfabe Instagram, there were some, some pictures posted that were correspondence from fanographics to printers they were working with about how to handle the original art <laughs> in the films and all this stuff. And Go read it if you're if you're listening to this and you're not sure about the tone of the comics journal, say in the early 80s, go look at that Instagram post and see what they sent to their printers. Guys who are touching the original art, mind you. I mean, they came out guns blazing. And I think it's probably, you know, the comics industry is so different now that it's hard to remember like how things would have been in the early 80s. And look, I wasn't reading them in the early 80s. I only know what comics history I've read. But for all the stuff that I get mad about and complain about now infinitely more of that was what the comics industry was in the early 80s. And, and with Fanographics, you have guys who are starting to publish books now, competition in other words, and then also the publishers of the Comics Journal, which is just 
coming out guns blazing about every bad policy that any publisher enacts, every book that they think is not done very well or hacked out or poor for whatever reason, like they were not sugarcoating anything. If you did anything that they didn't agree with, you it was going to be very, very clear to everyone who read the Comics Journal how they felt. And the Comics Journal had a lot of uh, public interest, you know, support around it from, from fans and fandom and, and certain creators, as you have stated. But you make enemies whenever you're calling everybody out. And that's what the Comics Journal was known for in those early days, like putting the comics industry on notice. <laughs> and uh, this court room drama became a place where some of these people could come out and get some some payback whether you were the marvel editor-in-chief eclipse publisher um you know some some big names came out to uh, testify on both sides and and uh important to i think understand where they're coming from and why they're angry because now you had a competitive competitive publisher who also had a gigantic mouthpiece and was saying that you sucked <laughs> this this absolutely divided uh divided the industry. Uh, Fleischer, I mean, court cases are not cheap. So there were plenty of artists who donated pages on behalf of Fleischer as a fundraising mechanism uh, for his lawyers. Gary Groth and, and, Fant and Kim Thompson in, in Fantagraphics, they put together the Anything, Anything Goes miniseries that was uh, uh, in an anthology series with a lot of donated artwork and comics from industry luminaries who didn't take any pay from that and Fanta was able to use uh, any profits from that for their court case. Plus there were other situations where artists would donate original artwork on behalf of, of Fanta graphics. Uh, all that stuff said with the journal and everything, they, they would still try to keep things honest. So like whenever I got into the game with Fanta, dudes like Jaime Gilbert, Dan Klaus, they, they all were like, Ed, if your thing is successful, uh, you will be getting roasted at least a little bit by Comics Journal. Uh, it'll never be anybody who matters who is talking about your comics. It'll they'll just get some freelance goober who got paid twenty bucks or something to write an article. But it's gonna it's gonna come and it's gonna mean that you're doing well for 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 the company, man. So uh, they they do what they can, you know, to try to keep that even playing field. But but you are right. It divided the it divided the comic book industry at the time. And the, when these people show up, everybody has some skin in the game. You, nobody's giving these character testimony depositions just out of the kindness of their own hearts. And uh, Jimmy, I think it's bad. It's bad optics for me to always be the lawyer. <laughs> in, in right. these things, man, I don't want to be associated with uh, the lawyer all the time, man. So if you don't mind, I I'll play the uh, the Jim Shooter rule. Hey, I think that's perfect. I actually am not a native Pittsburgher. I, I grew up a little bit south of Pittsburgh. So uh, if we're going to if we're going to channel Jim Shooter, Ed, I think you're the perfect guy to do it here. <laughs> I do think you have more of the Pittsburgh accent than I do, though. That could be. <laughs> uh I'm good to go if you are. You know, I asked I asked Eric Reynolds at uh, Fantagraphics if uh, if this was public domain, all that stuff. He says, yeah, I think so. And he's like, man, I can't wait to hear. And then he says, he just like typed in a thing, said, booby hatch. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and then when I open this up, there's the big question. Uh, what is your understanding of the term booby hatch, sir? Answer, I assume it's a place where they keep boobies. I don't know what that means, but I think we're going to get into that. <laughs> that is what they're leading off the, uh, the main page with here. So <laughs> it must mean something. All right, <clears throat> so let's begin. I am gonna start as S. Pitkin Marshall and uh, begin the direct examination. Who is your employer? Marvel Comics. In what capacity are you employed by Marvel Comics? I'm a vice president and I'm the editor in chief. Could you describe please your educational background? I graduated from high school. Have you had any education beyond high school? Only that I managed to work very closely with uh, several of the editors who more or less started uh, the comic book business. I sort of had a 10-year apprenticeship with a gentleman named Mort Weisinger and Stan Lee. But no formal education? No. When for the first time, if ever, did you start working in the comic book business? It was the summer of 1965. Can you tell me the circumstances or the occasion which caused you to start working in the comic book business? Well, my family was very poor and we didn't have money and I was 13. I didn't think I could get any kind of regular job. I wanted to help out and I saw a comic book and it looked like something I thought I could do. 
So I wrote stories and sent them into DC Comics, and they sent me checks in the mail and continued to use me regularly for the next five years. So I worked my way through high school to help support my family. After high school, did you have any connection with the comic book business? After high school, I got out of the comic book business for a couple of years because I never really intended to end up in the comic book business. It was something just to earn money from my family. I always thought that I'd go to college and pursue other interests. After high school, however, I tried a few other things and I didn't find anything that I liked as well as I liked writing, writing comics. When I was offered the opportunity to get back into the business in, in around 1973, maybe 74, I started writing. In 73 or 74, when you came back into the business, in what capacity did you come into the business and with what company? Well, first I started at DC Comics again as a writer writing Superman and other related characters. I did that for a couple of years and then, then I got an offer from Marvel Comics to be an associate editor, which is sort of the second in command to the editor in chief. I took that offer in 1976. Uh, I started working for Marvel Comics. Two years later, I was promoted to editor-in-chief, and I've been there ever since. You were promoted to editor-in-chief in 78? Yes. Between 78 and the present time, have you received any more promotions, or has your position at Marvel Comics changed in any way? Well, after a couple of years, I was made a vice president, and I guess that's the only title change. Uh, I think that the job has grown quite a bit. So what is your present position at Marvel Comics? As I say, I'm vice president, editor-in-chief. I am pretty much in charge of our entire creative effort, which publishes between 50 and 60 magazines a month. Would you describe in some detail and with some organization what it is you do as editor-in-chief at Marvel? Well, in charge of Marvel Comics is the president, Jim Galton. I report technically to no other man who is... Uh, to, I, I report technically to another man who is the publisher named Mike Hobson. Uh, but in fact... We have both equal responsibility and we both report directly to Jim Galton. Mike Hobson uh, takes care of most of the business and legal type administration, printers, contracts, things like that. I take care of anything to do with the creative effort, anything to do with the creation of magazines and books, anything to do with engraving. Could you give us some examples or categories? When you say anything to do with creative effort, what functions is, that, is it that you are in charge of that go in the business? For instance, editorial, I am in charge of a number of editors. I supervise them. They are the people who actually hire artists and writers to do the creative work on the comic books. I think we have something like 18 editors. We have about 60 people on staff. We employ something like 300 creative people, uh, most of whom work on a freelance basis. Some have contracts to deliver uh, a certain amount of material per month or whatever, but it is essentially a freelance business. I am in charge of all of that. I'm also in charge of the production, the manufacturing of books. I oversee the production manager and all the internal production facilities, typesetting, photo stats, paste up, mechanicals, and basically from the very inception of the book until it is printed and the distribution process begins, I'm in charge of everything. As to the freelance people, can you describe briefly how and where they work and how they connect in with the staff people? Generally, they work at their homes uh, or in their own studios. They are the people who are actually doing the writing, draw the pictures, do the coloring, do the, do the lettering. They do the bulk of the creative work under the guidance of the editors and with the help of uh, the support troops. Some of them are re regular full-time. As I say, some even have kind of contracts delivering uh, a certain amount of material. Some people for... Some work for us uh, on a more occasional basis, but they essentially are the creative people who do the. There are about 300 of them. At least. Uh, there may be more that we use on an occasional basis. Those people and the staff people and the editors in the house all report to you. Is that correct? Yes. Can you tell me approximately how many titles Marvel publishes each month? Somewhere between 50 and 60, we have, I believe, nearly 50 regular titles that come out on a monthly or bi-monthly basis. And then we have specialties and limited series and one shots, and it usually averages somewhere in the 50s. Can you tell us approximately how many comic books Marvel puts out each month? I think we distribute over 12 million copies a month. We sell something around 8 million. Can you describe to the jury the size of Marvel compared with other publishers of comic books? We are far and away the biggest. Estimates of our market share vary, uh, varies de dependent on what you count. If you count Mad and Cracked Magazine, 
the market share goes down. If you don't, it goes up. But we are easily more than half of the comic book market and by far, far bigger than anybody else. Can you tell me how Marvel has fared economically since you became the editor-in-chief? And then Patrick Lyons, who I think is the uh, lawyer for Fleischer's side, has, a, has interjects here. Objection, Your Honor, irrelevant. And the court responds, objection sustained, and we're back to Marshall. Is Marvel as successful now as it was several years ago? Lyons again. Objection, Your Honor, irrelevant. The court sustained, back to Marshall. What comic work have you done, Mr. Shooter, just generally since the time you returned to comics and started working on comics? Well, I've been an editor and editor-in-chief. I've also done some writing. I've written all of Marvel's well-known characters, Spider-Man, Hulk, Iron Man, Daredevil, Fantastic Four. I wrote the Bible for the Transformers series. I've been very involved in creative de development of toys like G.I. Joe. Are you familiar with the Comics Journal? Yes, I am. What is the basis for your familiarity? Well, it's one of the fan publications, which is sent to our office regularly every month. I make it a point to look through it. Can you tell me how it is sent to your office, how it is distributed in your office, and how it reaches you? Well, they sent us a box full of copies. I don't know how many are in there. Are they complimentary? Yes, 50 or so complimentary copies, I suppose. My assistant distributes them to the people that we've identified as the key people who might want to see what's going on. Do you yourself obtain a copy each month? Yes, I do. Can you describe to what extent or with what thoroughness you read it every month? I don't read all of every issue. I make it a point to sort of page through it and see if anything catches my eye. My name jumps out at me a lot. Uh, basically, if something does catch my eye, I'll, I'll read it. Do you consider that it's part of your business function to be familiar with what's in the comics journal? Yes, I do. For how long, for how many years has that been true? That is that type of familiarity with the comics journal and that type of reading of the journal? Well, since it started, I don't know exactly when it started, but certainly ever since I've been editor in chief. Uh, and I think before that, the journal is very slick. It's very well put together, well written. It very frequently has things of interest in it. At least since 1978, when you became editor in chief, you considered it part of your business to familiarize yourself each month with the journal? Yes, I do. Can you tell us to what extent the comics journal is read in the comics industry? I noticed that at Marvel, however many copies there are, 50 or whatever it is, are eagerly sought after. I can see people uh, the day after the journal arrives reading it and borrowing each other's copies if they weren't uh, one of the ones that was uh, considered important uh, enough to, as they get the copies. Uh, and I know that it's discussed very frequently on the day after it has arrived. I think we will stop at this point. I think I told the jury we would adjourn at 12. We will adjourn now, ladies and gentlemen, until Monday at 930. Please remember, do not discuss this case with anyone and have a happy, have a very happy Thanksgiving. Jury left the courtroom, trial resumed, open court, jury present. The court. Good morning. We will continue with the direct examination of Mr. Shooter. Marshall. You know what, let's pause a second. Anything you wanna unpack from that uh, opening, <laughs> opening testimonies? Well, for one thing, this is much different than the Neil Gaiman piece that was just in some office, some boardroom with cameras and a little stenographer or something. This is a fucking court case. Money is being spent, the meter is running and we are in front of a courtroom, a judge and a jury of our peers. That's, that's, that's high octane environment. And already you can see what Jim Shooter's doing, man, uh, <laughs> pumping up the magazine. Like it's like one of the most important documents uh, of, of the industry so that uh, it could lean towards, his testimony can lean towards the favor of Michael Fleischer already. He's, he's sowing those seeds. <laughs> yeah, he also calls it a, a fan magazine. Yeah, <laughs> that made me laugh. Man. <laughs> Which is, is definitely a shot. And uh, it's kind of funny to me, some of the numbers that he throws out, the one that stands out is the distributing 12 million copies a month and selling 8 million. Um, what I would add to that is this is the beginning of the direct market where these publishers, you know, for anybody that's listening and maybe unfamiliar with the early 80s, as comics switched over from newsstand distribution to direct market, those numbers would change. The number of copies distributed versus the number of copies sold, the difference would get smaller and smaller as companies moved into the direct market, uh, which is essentially the stores 
pre-ordering and paying for these comics, uh, regardless of whether they sell them to readers or not, um, which was sort of great for the companies because now you could distribute 8 million copies and get paid for 8 million as opposed to having 4 million that just nobody bought, uh, which was the old model. So just to give some context of where that business is. The cool um, thing, the cool thing is that it's because it is the direct market, it's only 4 million copies. So like the way that it was always described to me when it was uh, most like all newsstand, it was almost a 50% loss. Where well, like I, if, I think that these numbers are probably, I don't know when this is exactly 84, 85, maybe. I don't think it was 86, but it's it's a few years into that direct market run. So I think those numbers are better than if you had gone back 10 years before this, if you'd have gone back to 75, say, uh, pre any real direct market, I think you're right. That ratio is much higher on number of distribution versus number sold. And 50-50 uh, you know, is about what I heard in the past too. So you can see why publishers, when the direct market showed up, were eager to jump on that. Um, guarantee sells much better than printing two copies and selling one. And by the way, as as creatives involved, the direct market is cop copies of comics that are sold, and you and I still have to wait six months for our fucking checks. Yes. How, how does that work? Um, last button I'll put on this opening salvo is one of the big pieces of contention between, say, Fanographics and the Comics Journal versus Marvel and, say, Marvel and DC is that once the direct market happens and you have comic book shops pre-ordering books, this has opened up avenues for fanographics to publish because now they could do very specialized, much more specialized comics that didn't have millions of readers, but they could still be profitable because they didn't have to overprint, uh, you know, and then throw away a bunch of copies. Marvel and DC answered this as like, the comics industry is a pie and we want the big, we want as much of that pie as we can get. And it's finite, you know, it's pie, plate is only how big the pie can be. Uh, in real terms, it was comic book sh shops ha only have so much shelf space. Let's fill it complete. Let's publish more Marvel books because they're going to order all of our books and we will fill up that shelf space. And then Fanographics or any other publisher, there's only so much shelf space. You know, we're so many dollars that these comic shops have to order. And if we increase the volume of titles that we publish, we can take more and more of the percentage of what whatever is available in the direct market. And that was one of those um, things that the Comics Journal really went hard against forever. Uh, you know, I mean, I think they're still against that practice. And so you can see why Marvel might have an issue with the guys who are criticizing their their business model. Shovelware comics still exist, baby. Totally. So let's resume court after Thanksgiving. <laughs> let's uh, do it. All right. The court. Good morning. We will continue with the direct examination of Mr. Shooter. Marshall, Mr. Shooter, to your knowledge, is the comics journal read widely also outside of the Marvel Publishing Company? Yes, it is. What is your knowledge of that matter? I frequently discuss the journal and other things in the journal with other professionals, with retailers, with wholesalers. And also, if you look at their letter column, you can see every month that there are letters from professionals, from distributors, from retailers. And if you read the letters, you can see that they've read it. Do you have an opinion as to the impact of the comics journal on the comic book industry? Yes, I do. What is your opinion? I think that it has a substantial impact, especially on the direct market side of the business. Why do you say that? Because it is widely read, because a lot of professionals read it, and a lot of distributors read it, a lot of retailers read it, key people in the in industry read it, and I believe that their letters... And from our discussions that they have uh, been influenced by it. Are you familiar with Harlan Ellison? Yes, I am. What is your knowledge of Harlan Ellison? Harlan is a well-known science fiction writer. He's written a lot of television. He gives lectures. He does appearances. What connection, if any, does Harlan Ellison have with the comic book industry? I think he has quite a bit. He has a lot of friends in the comic book industry. Len Wein, Marv Wolfman, Mark Avanier, a lot of other people. He has done some work. Uh, for the comic book industry, has actually written a story for Marvel, DC, and has done uh, promotional blurbs for them, uh, things like that. And he has appeared at comic book conventions and performed, given his lectures and so forth. And he is generally well known, I think partially because of the science fiction audience and the comic book uh, audience overlap. A lot of the same readers who read science fiction and uh, read comics. Could you tell us briefly about that? And why is that? I think the readers who are interested in action, adventure, fantasy, and so forth would find what they are looking for in both comics and science fiction. Do you know Michael Fleischer? 
Yes, I do. Can you tell us how you first came to know him? Well, aside from seeing his name in comic books, see, I worked through the mail from Pittsburgh for a number of years. And I only moved to New York in 1976. So sometime after I moved to New York, I guess 76, 77, I probably met him at a volleyball game. We used to play uh, volleyball after work in Central Park, and that's probably where I met him. We being who? People from the office, artists, writers, editors. Uh, after work, we would go over to Central Park and play volleyball. Is this the DC office or the Marvel office? In those days, the offices uh, were very close together, so it would be a mixture. Prior to 1980, what, if anything, was your professional connection with Michael Fleischer? I'm not sure exactly when Michael started writing uh, for Marvel, but I don't think we had a professional connection before then. Prior to 1980, what social connection, if any, did you have with Michael Fleischer? I'd run into him at a volleyball game occasionally, and I suppose maybe at some sort of industry function, cocktail parties, something like that, uh, I might have seen him. When Michael Fleischer did begin doing work for Marvel, what was your capacity at Marvel at that time? I was editor-in-chief. Can you tell us what was the earliest work that, Michael, that Mr. Fleischer did for Marvel? He might have done a couple of inventory stories, but the thing I remember uh, kind of getting him to do was a title called Spider-Woman. For how long did he work on that? I don't know exactly. I think a year uh, or month more. Sick. In terms of your professional relationships to him, when he was on Spider-Woman, what was the connection, if any? I was, in those days, I was fairly actively involved editorially. I was doing a lot of work directly on the books. Uh, basically, I had a lot of young editors. I had to work uh, with, him, with him quite a bit. I remember that I was uh, the one who hired Michael for the job, and I think I actually edited a few of the stories. Other than Spider-Woman, what other works of Michael Fleischer are you familiar with? I've read a lot of his stories. Uh, it's part of my job to keep up with everything uh, from Marvel. He did a strip called Ghost Rider. He wrote sort of Conan. Uh, I've read DC Comics work of his, Jonah Hex. Uh, he wrote a bunch of mystery stories. They had uh, magazines called House of Mystery and House of Secrets, things like that. And he would write stories for those and the Spectre stories. What is your business relationship with Michael Fleischer at this point? He doesn't work for us now, none. What is your social relationship with Michael Fleischer at this point? I haven't seen Michael for years. Did he ask you or approach you or ask you to testify in this case? No. When was the last time you talked to him? As I said, it would be years ago, three or four years. Prior to February 1980, what was Michael Fleischer's reputation in the comic industry? I don't think he had much of a re reputation. He was a regular, uh, competent writer and was not discussed a lot. As to his work, as opposed to his person, what was the reputation of his work? I think his work was very well regarded. I certainly liked it. Uh, that's why I sought him out to come work for us. Can you tell me what reputation he had in terms of the practical aspects of work, such as turning out product, meeting deadlines, showing up for meetings with editors? He was an exemplary worker. He was always on time. He was usually early. He was very cooperative. He was easy to work with. He would do rewrites and corrections without any argument. He was very professional. Prior to 1980, did Michael Fleischer have any kind of reputation for being crazy or deranged or mentally impaired in any way? No, not at all. Let me show you what has been marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 53 in evidence and ask you, first of all, are you familiar with that issue of the Comics Journal number 53? Yes, I am. Let me refer you to Harlan Ellison interview, which begins on page 69 of the issue. Are you familiar with that? Yes. What is the basis of your familiarity? When this issue arrived at the office, I read it. We got complimentary copies. Let me show you what has been marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 59, Journal 59, in this case, and specifically the interview with Ted White, which begins on page 56 of that exhibit, and more specifically, certain references to Michael Fleischer, which are contained on page 81 of the Ted White interview. Would you take a look at that, please? Are you familiar with that issue of the Comics Journal? Yes. Are you familiar with the Ted White interview? Yes, I am. And with the references in it to Michael Fleischer? Yes, I am. What is the basis of that familiarity? Once again, when this issue arrived at the office, I probably flipped through it. Uh, since I know the name Ted White, I read the interview and I read the comments. Objection, if the answer is probably moved to strike. The court, sustained, it will be stricken. Back to Marshall. When the issue arrived at the office, did you read the Ted White interview? Yes, I did. 
Did you read the specific references in that interview to Michael Fleischer? Yes, I did. Let me refer you to what has been marked in evidence as plaintiff's exhibit 62, 65 through 67, 69 through 84, and 87 through 100, various back issue pages from the journal. I ask you to look at those exhibits. Mr. Shooter, are you familiar generally with the back issues pages or page of the comics journal? Yes, I am. As to the back issue pages, which are contained in that series of exhibits, are you familiar with those particular back issue pages or generally are you familiar with them? I'm sure I read most of them. And did you observe from time to time the references on the back issue pages to Michael Fleischer? Yes, I did. What is the basis of your familiarity or the reason why you are familiar with the back issue pages of the comics journal? Well, actually, I think uh, the reason I first looked at those was to see what they said about various issues in which I had appeared and I'd look at them periodically. Returning your attention once again to the original exhibit I showed you, that is the Ellison interview, do you have an opinion as to whether that interview had any effect on Michael Fleischer's reputation in the comics industry? Yes, I do. What is your opinion? My opinion is that it did him a great deal of damage. Do you have an opinion as to whether the references in issue number 59 in the Ted White interview had any effect on Michael Fleischer's reputation? Yes, I do. What is your opinion as to that? I think it continued and expanded uh, what had been started in the Ellison interview. Do you have an opinion as to whether the several references in the little book that I showed you, the back issue references from exhibits 62, 65, 87 through 100, whether those references had any effect on Michael Fleischer's reputation? Yes, I do. What is your opinion? I think that, that they ridiculed him and they continued and expanded the previous, you know, comments and references. Can you tell us what knowledge or information do you have that you base your opinions on? Well, it's sort of my job to know as editor in chief of Marvel Comics, who's hot and who's not, who's well received by the marketplace and who isn't. I spend an awful lot of time traveling around the country, appearing at conventions and at retail stores. And when I'm there, I make it my business to talk to the other retailers, the distributors, the writers and artists and so forth. Once a year, Marvel Comics has a meeting where we file in all the distributors and we do kind of a three or four day show and tell where we show them what we've got coming up. We listen to their complaints and problems. We basically have kind of three or four days of nonstop discussions on precisely this sort of subject. Also at stores and at conventions, I am constantly talking to fans. I sit at a table all day and fans come and I autograph books. We talk about writers, talk about artists. I participate in panel discussions where such things are discussed. I also do slideshows of upcoming projects and announce uh, the creative teams and so forth uh, and hear the reactions. Do you have an opinion as to whether the several references to Michael Fleischer that I've just shown you, the original Ellison statements in issue 53, the references in the Ted White interview and the back issue references, do you have an opinion as to whether these statements have affected Michael Fleischer's ability to economically to be economically successful in the comic book industry. And Norwick, objection. Lyons, objection, objection, no foundation. Norwick, also no claim for such damages. Lyons, and relevance, your honor, and the court, sustained. Back to Marshall. Do you have an opinion as to whether the statements in the several issues of the comics journal that I've referred to you have affected Michael Fleischer's ability or a publisher's ability to sell books written by Michael Fleischer? Lyons. Objection once again, it is the same question recast slightly, the court. Would you read that question? Question read, the court. I will sustain the objection as to form. Marshall, do you have any information that comic books written by Michael Fleischer are difficult to market in the comic book industry? Lyons, objection, your honor, the court overruled. Yes, I do. Would you tell us what that information is? It is difficult to sell a book written by Michael Fleischer in the direct market. Why is that? Because there is a resistance in the direct market to the name Michael Fleischer. The, di the direct market is the collector's market. It is the comic specialty shops. Generally, they have older customers, more knowledgeable customers, people who are conscious of the writers and the artists as opposed to the newsstand, which tends to be more spontaneous, casual readers. And in the marketplace, uh, the name of the writer very much influences the buying of the books. It influences the order, the orders that the retailers make and the orders that the distributors make. And it influences the customers who ultimately buys the book in those stores. 
I'm aware that Michael Fleischer's name is a detriment to sales in the market. Laying it on heavy, Jimmy. <laughs> and in your view, what is the reason for his name being detriment? Lions objection, court overruled. I believe that it began to be a detriment due to the interview and the subsequent continuation of the things said there. Lyons, your honor, I am moving to strike all testimony based upon the witness's statement that it began to become a detriment. There is no testimony that he ever sold in the direct market. I am moving to strike all of the expert testimony. The court overruled. Marshall, Mr. Shooter, let me refer you to plaintiff's exhibit 57, Journal 57, in evidence, and specifically to the piece entitled Plumbing the Sewer by Dwight Decker, which starts on page 45 of that issue. Are you familiar with that piece? Yes, I am. What is the basis? Court, just a minute, please. I want to see counsel. In the robing room, all counsel present, the court. I had intended to raise this later with counsel, but since you, Mr. Marshall, are now about to elicit information about Exhibit 57, Plumbing the Sewer, I better raise it now. I have given some further thought to my ruling, excluding the book, Chasing Harry, and to the extent that there is going to be reliance by the plaintiff here upon the review of that book by Mr. Decker, there is going to be, it seems to me at this stage, every reason to admit that book into evidence. This will be, of course, particularly germane with respect to the false light claim. There is scarcely any way that the jury can tell whether this Exhibit 57 put Mr. Fleischer in a false light unless it sees the book that he read that is being reviewed. Marshall, your honor, in view of that ruling or suggested ruling, I think we would withdraw any reliance on the Decker piece. Norwick, your honor, Decker's review of Chasing Harry is in evidence and the jury has it. They had made numerous reference to it over our objection. They never sued over it. It's five or six years since it was published. They never claimed libel or false light arising out of the Decker review. Your Honor admitted it into evidence. I think the reasoning was somehow that it shed light on the state of mind earlier, but it's in evidence. We renew our request that Chasing Harry be admitted, but I don't think that Mr. Marshall can now on the 12th day of trial attempt to limit the proof of the Decker review. It's in evidence. He has mined it for all it's worth in this case, and we would renew our application to Chasing Harry and also our objection to any eliciting of proof as to injury of reputation over an alleged libel that was not sued over. Henry Holmes, there have been sweeping statements, especially in that deposition of a reaction to Mr. Fleischer after the Ellison interview and after publication of the book. The witness was never able to tie that into the interview to the publicity on the lawsuit or to the book. It's only fair, and we would join in that application, that the jury have that opportunity to read the book and to make its own decision as to what caused the supposed ramifications to Mr. Fleischer. The court, I am not ruling now whether the book comes in or not. I just want to draw to your attention that at this stage, I do think the book is going to be germane to any claims that are predicated upon Exhibit 57. Norwick, may I make a statement? Mr. Marshall is now eliciting generalized testimony about injury to reputation over a whole slew of publications that were not sued over for defamation. Although I think it sort of helps me on cross, I think it is improper to elicit opinion as to reputational injury over material that is not sued over, not sued in this case. What they are trying to do is sweep in all of these other non-sued over publications and get a generalized testimony as to injury of reputation. It is just confusing, very prejudicial, I will do what I can on cross. The court, I think you will probably be able to do an effective job on cross. Norwick, can I have a copy of this page of the transcript? Laughter. The court, thank you. Open court. The court, ladies and gentlemen, there has been an examination of Mr. Shooter with respect to various documents and these documents included exhibit 53 and then various other exhibits. Exhibit 53 as agreed has been introduced with respect to all defendants. The other exhibits with respect to which Mr. Shooter is presently being examined have only been admitted with respect to Mr. Groth and Fanographics. They have not been received with respect to Mr. Ellison. Marshall. Mr. Shooter, I asked you to look at the Plaintiff's Exhibit 61, Journal 61, in evidence, and specifically to look at the Newswatch section, which begins on page 26 of that exhibit. First of all, are you familiar with that issue of the Comics Journal? Yes, I am. And might I say, Jimmy, conjecture? Fleischer's lawyers are doing everything they could to not have the novel with the blowjob and the and the chick getting put on fire admitted into the courtroom whatsoever. They were trying to earn their money right there, man. 
Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> it's such a funny detail to consider. You know what, though, a lot of these comics, uh, law cases, like what comics and what, you know, like what material that the, that the person in question has created, is, it's a big piece. Like uh, Bob Levine has written about this, about the Air Pirates and about the um, Chester the Molester uh, cartoonist from Hustler Magazine, who was convicted and then his case was overturned because they ruled that admin, ad, ad, admitting his Hustler Magazine cartoons in the evidence prejudiced the jury. Right. So it's really interesting. Like this is like your art, separate the artist from the art, kind of like from a legal standpoint is what, you know, it is, is really being covered in this particular passage. And we, and we are just cartoonists. We, we don't know much, man. But to me, when it's like you're getting like a character testimony, like does that not include the character of the creator when, when you're dealing with something like that? But clearly. Yeah, these are, uh, I have a feeling if you were a lawyer, you could find a lot of court coverage on this kind of a topic. I bet. All right, back to it. Marshall. Second, are you familiar with the Newswatch section, which refers to Michael Fleischer and says he is filing a lawsuit against Fanographics, Gary Groth, and Harlan Ellison? Yes, I am. Do you have an opinion as to whether that Newswatch section had any effect on Michael Fleischer's reputation? Yes, I do. What is your opinion? I think it furthers what we had uh, begun before. In your view, have the several statements and references to Michael Fleischer, which I have reviewed with you this morning, had any effect on the willingness of editors to give him work? Lyons, objection. The court, sustained as to Mr. Lyons. Answer the question. This is received only with respect to Mr. Groth and Fanographics. Lyons, objection. The court, overruled. Well, it's my job uh, to do that. I supervise a group of editors who choose writers and artists, and most certainly it has to enter our thinking that if a writer bears a stigma or has some resistance in the marketplace, it's one of the factors that you have to weigh when you are trying to assemble a creative team. Would you describe for us the practice of creative groups of getting together and working in creative groups? It has changed significantly since the comic book business introduced the concept of royalties. Before that time, royalties began being paid for work for, actually, I should be very exact there. It's an incentive, which is functionally the same as a royalty but that they were introduced around 1982. Before that time, the writer and the artist worked for the editor. They delivered the material to the editor and really they had no economic concern after that. They delivered the material, were paid by the editor and it was really academic what other people worked on the other comic, what other people worked on the comic book. Uh, there is generally a writer and at least two artists who work on a comic book. When the system was introduced in 1982, whether it was a royalty or whether it was a payment based on how many copies were sold in addition to the payment for actually just delivering the, the work, suddenly it became a matter of great economic concern to a writer who the artist would be and whether that artist would be of any help selling the book or whether he would be a detriment. It became a team support, in other words, and all other players on the team were very much concerned about how well an issue would sell because their royalty would depend on how well that issue sold. Uh, I should also add, by the way, that at Marvel Comics, editors also participate in the incentive plan. The editor is paid according to how well the books sell, and so am I. Everybody has a keen interest on anything that will impact the sales of the book. Mr. Shooter, beginning just with issue number 53 and the original statements by Harlan Ellison in the interview, in your view, have those statements themselves exclusive if anything else that came, for, came afterward had any effect on Michael Fleischer's ability to be part of creative groups or work groups? Yes, it did. Definitely did. Have the subsequent statements that were published in the Comics Journal also had some effect on Michael Fleischer's ability to be included in creative groups? Yes, they have. What is the effect and why is it? Lions. Objection. The court. Sustained. Back to Marshall. As to the first publication, issue 53, what was the effect of your view, in your view, that had and why did it affect his ability to be in creative groups? Well, I think that it had a great effect. I know it's difficult to form a team on around Michael Fleischer. Uh, I think that the interview itself defined Michael Fleischer to a lot of professional people who, di who didn't know him and 
Define him as what or as who? It defined him as a sort of a madman who only wrote twisted horror stories. And I think that that being the case, there were people who, I know that there are people who do not want to work with him because they feel that it will damage the sellability of the product. As to the subsequent publications, Mr. Shooter, the references to Michael Fleischer, which came after the initial Harlan Ellison interview, have they had an effect on Michael Fleischer's ability to be included in work groups, creative groups? Yes, they have. What is the effect and what is the basis for saying so? The basic, the basis for saying that it's my, my group job uh, to put these groups together. I am constantly trying to do exactly that. And I think that these additional things kind of argumentative expand uh, what was introduced about Michael in this interview. It has an effect on professional people who are not personally familiar with Michael. You described to some extent the difference between the comic shops, the comic specialty shop market, and the newsstand market. I'd like to follow that up a bit and ask you, as to the newsstand side of it, who is the typical buyer and what does he base his buying on? Our experience shows us that the newsstand market tends to be buyers who are more casual buyers. The newsstand market does not seem to react very much to the name of the writer, to the name of the artist. Sales are fairly steady within certain parameters. The newsstand market serves as 40,000 outlets through some 400 to 500 distributors. All the copies are distributed on a consignment basis. What they don't sell, they return for full credit. Basically, distribution is fairly sporadic. It's spotty. A person who is a serious collector, aficionado, would really have to go to a comic specialty shop to make sure to get every issue of every title that they were interested in. Would you just amplify the statement you made earlier this morning about who is the buyer in a comics specialty store and how does that market differ? Well, as I said, uh, while you get a spectrum of buyers in the comic specialty stores, it tends to be uh, the place where older readers go, where collectors go, where people who are knowledgeable go, where the collectors go, where the people who are interested in getting every issue go. It tends to be people who respond to the names of the writers or the artists as opposed to the newsstand market, where your sales are fairly steady. On the direct market, you can have wide swings of sales just based on the, the change of one creator. For example, we've recently published an issue of X-Men where we had an artist, a guest artist. Instead of the usual artists, we had a fellow named Barry Windsor Smith, who's a very popular artist. The newsstand, sales, the newsstand sales stayed the same. The direct market sales almost doubled. The only thing that changed was the person drawing the book. So a person can have a very serious impact, positive or negative, on the sales of a book in that market. And therefore, since the creators are paid accordingly to sales, that's where the creators make their money. Which of those two markets is it that the effect on Michael Fleischer's reputation is the most damaging? Well, Michael Fleischer's name is a problem in the direct market. His name is a detriment to sales in the direct market. It may be that it has some effect on the newsstand, but it's very difficult to tell that. Have the several effects on Michael's reputation that you have told us about, in your view, have they affected his ability to make a name for himself in the future? Lions, objection, Norwick, relevance. The court sustained, back to Marshall. Mr. Shooter, first of all, starting with the Harlan Ellison interview, how would the effect on Michael Fleischer's, how long would the effect on Michael Fleischer's reputation and sellability last from that interview? Norwick, objection, Lyons, objection, court sustained, back to Marshall. Mr. Shooter, do you have any opinion as to whether Michael Fleischer's reputation in the future will be affected by the statements in the Harlan Ellison interview? Yes, I do. What is your opinion about that? Well, my opinion is that this has gone on for several years and I don't see any signs of change. I think that the damage is very severe and very deep and it could be quite a long time before people have forgotten. Have the statements which Harlan Ellison made in issue number 53 become associated in any direct way with Michael Fleischer among the fans in the industry? Lions, objection, it calls for the elicitation of hearsay. The court, overruled. The way I'd answered that is that I've heard reference uh, to those statements from people. I've heard references to the words certifiable and deranged and derangeo by, by fans at conventions. Have the statements in the Ellison interview had any effect on Michael Fleischer's chances of being a hot writer or a star writer or a big name writer? I believe that it is not possible now. I think that he is quite a problem in the direct sales market, which would 
It's hard for me to imagine. I know that I wouldn't hire him on a book that I expected that I hoped would do well in the direct uh, sales market because I don't think there's a chance. You mentioned the bonus or royalty plan that Marvel instituted several years ago. Can you tell us when that went into effect? The court, 1982. Yes. What effect did that bonus plan have on the income of writers who were working for Marvel? I was a freelancer for a long time before I became editor-in-chief, so I was very aware of the problems of freelancers. When I became editor-in-chief, I immediately started driving up rates. Uh, The introduction of the incentive plan was really to bring creative people in the comic books into line with creative people in other fields, and it was intended to be a dramatic increase in the income of people in the creative field, and it was. Could you tell me how much of an increase in writers' incomes it caused from the years 1982 through the next couple of years? In page rates alone, uh, that's the payment upfront that a writer receives when he delivers his work. Uh, Those have been more than tripled since I've become editor-in-chief, let's say in the last six or seven years. With the incentive, most people's uh, full-time writer's income, depending on the title that they're working on, went up sometimes double or more. An average writer who works full-time on a Marvel comic I think his income is probably tripled or quadrupled easily. If Michael Fleischer's gross income adjusted after inflation increased by about 19% from 1980 to 1983, would you consider that to be keeping up with other writers? I would say that that was falling behind drastically. Can you tell me what ranges of income were in, let's say, 1983 of other writers from Marvel who wrote on a full-time basis? Lions. Objection, Your Honor. There has been no showing that plaintiff ever wrote on a full-time basis for Marvel, the court, sustained. Marshall, do you know, Mr. Shooter, what the range of incomes were for comic book writers in the industry at Marvel, at DC, in the years 1982, 1983, 1984? Lyons, objection, irrelevant, immaterial, incompetent, and move to strike. The court, sustained. Marshall, If Michael Fleischer's gross income in 1983 were in the range of $50,000, how would that compare to other writers in the comic book industry? Lyons, objection, irrelevant, incompetent, and immaterial. Norwick, objection, the court, sustained. Marshall, would you explain the work for hire concept in the comic book industry? Well, the work for hire concept is the same in the comic book industry as it is in most other creative industries. What it means is that if you are a writer or an artist working on a character which is owned by a comic book company, then you are really just selling your time, you are selling your service, and that the real author of the work is the company itself. When you do work for hire, you work under the supervision and under the direction of an agent of that company, an editor, and they are really in control of what is done. If you're going to write a Mickey Mouse cartoon for Disney, uh, they would tell you exactly how to do it, you would be giving parameters, you would work to meet their approval, or it it would not be seen. Most creative work is done that way. If you work for an advertising agency, uh, or most movie companies, or, you know, most creative work is done that way. Certainly in comics, most creative work is done that way. Lions. Objection and move to strike out as how most creative work is done in advertising agencies and in movies, and it also seems to me to be offering legal opinion. The court, overruled, Marshall. Under the work for hire system in the comics industry, who is responsible for the storylines and the stories? The company and specifically the editor assigned to it is in complete charge. Who is responsible if the stories get an adverse fan reaction? As I said, the company is technically the author of the work, and it's not uncommon for an editor to rewrite uh, entire, entirely a story or to give the writer the plot uh, to the story or to have the art entirely redrawn. So it is the company. If the company owns the character, the company owns the work, and the company is responsible for the work. Are you familiar with the Mask series? Yes. Are you familiar with the Warlord? Yes, I am. Are, you, are those favorable assignments for a writer? No, they are not. The Mask is a toy tie-in title. It is a title that is based on a toy. It is very difficult to get creative teams to work on books that are licensed from toy companies. They generally don't do well. Uh, they are not uh, as much fun. The Warlord series is a Barbarian series. I think it's pretty bulletproof. Uh, certainly not a big seller. I wouldn't say that it was a choice assignment. What do you mean by bulletproof? 
Well, as I say, it's a barbarian title. My experience with titles like Conan the Barbarian and similar titles is that they are titles which generally uh, not much influenced by who writes them or who draws them. They tend to sell better on the newsstand. They tend to have very small but steady direct sales. They are not uh, sensitive, like a toy tie-in is not sensitive to the writer. You could uh, leave the name off and it wouldn't make a difference. Is either of those two series the kind of product that a writer can make a name for himself with or become a star or hot writer with? Lions, objection, Norwick, objection, the court sustained. Back to Marshall. Did there come a time when you announced at a convention a new work by Michael Fleischer? Yes. Can you tell us when was that and what convention it was? It was Chicago in 1980, I believe. Can you tell us what you announced and what happened? Well, the way we do this is that Marvel has, I guess, what you call a panel discussion. We get several Marvel artists and writers to sit up on a stage and people come to see what's going to be coming out from Marvel. Uh, The way we do it is we show slides of what the artwork is going to look like and talk about each project that is coming up and tell you who's working on it. Fans can see the artwork so that they know uh, from that. Um, They're usually very knowledgeable. It is very easy for them to see who drew or did the inking on a series as we discuss what is going to happen in each of these issues that we are spotlighting, we talk about who is writing and so forth. That particular incident I remember involving Michael was that we announced that he was going to be writing Savage Sword of Conan and the announcement was booed enthusiastically by people there. How many people were in the hall? Lions, objection and move to strike. It doesn't relate to any issue in this case. The court overruled, Marshall. How many people were in the hall when the announcement was made? I would estimate 500. Did there come a time when Michael Fleischer's mental health was discussed in a panel discussion at a convention? Yes. Can you tell us when that was and what was the convention? It was at the San Diego convention. It was the summer of the year after the interview. I don't remember the year, 79 perhaps, I don't know. It was the the summer after the interview. Who was on the panel? The panel consisted of Mark Avanier, who was the moderator. Mark is a writer for television and comics. It had Len Wein on the panel, a comics writer. Marv Wolfen was on the panel. A gentleman named Al Hartley, who writes Archie Comics. A lady named Charmin Devona, who writes or used to write for Hanna-Barbera. A fellow named Scott Shaw, who used to write Hanna-Barbera Comics. And a man named B. Clyburn, who wrote the the cat books. Uh, I don't know who else to describe them. Can you tell us what was the announced topic of the panel discussion? The title of the panel was Morality in Comics. Uh, That sounded interesting to me, so I went to listen uh, what they had to say. Can you tell me what was the substance of the discussion, how the discussion opened, and what was said in substance? Lions, objection. Who is this being offered against, Your Honor? Norwick, objection on more general grounds, Your Honor. The court. I will see counsel in the robing room, the court. Where are we going, Mr. Marshall? Marshall, the offer, your honor, is that the whole subject matter of this panel discussion was Michael Fleischer's mental health and that the discussion was carried out in terms of which showed that the participants were linking his mental health to statements made by Harlan Ellison. Norwick, your honor, it is obviously all hearsay. What Mr. Marshall just said is directly inconsistent with Mr. Shooter's deposition, which I suppose is proper grounds for cross, but to have Mr. Shooter come up here and tell us what was said on a panel discussion strikes me as a classic hearsay. It is an attempt to prove, apparently, injury to reputation through hearsay, and we would object on on these grounds. Lyons. Your Honor, my problem since the, the first five minutes of Mr. Shooter on the stand was that I am not quite sure what he is an expert on, number one. Number two, if he is any kind of expert, it would seem only on comic book practices and procedures. Number three, if that happens to be true, then his testimony as to impact on Mr. Fleischer throughout the industry seems to lack any kind of foundation and is very thinly disguised as hearsay masquerading as expert testimony. Marshall, as we stated, and I think very successfully in terms of the Mulaney deposition, this isn't hearsay because it is not offered for the truth of it. The last thing we are trying to prove is the truth of the statements that Michael Fleischer is crazy. It is not hearsay because all it shows is the feelings or the state of mind of the people making the utterances. 
Norwick, trying to prove the truth of injury to reputation through hearsay. They cannot produce a live witness to say he thought less of Mr. Fleischer, and so as a result, they have to prove that through hearsay. The essential ingredient, clear and convincing proof, is that there was injury to reputation. They don't have a live witness to testify to injury to reputation, so they have to drag it through Mulaney's hearsay and Shooter's hearsay. Indeed, people thought he was crazy. That's precisely what they are trying to prove through hearsay. Marshall. What counsel is saying is just wrong. That is that it's not hearsay what other people have said. What other people have said, the statements they've made that Shooter has heard is not hearsay. Contrary to what counsel says, we are not offering it to prove the truth of those statements. We are offering it to prove that those people have those views, that mental state, those feelings. That's not hearsay. It can come in through an expert, come in through a lay witness on a damages question. It can come in on a question of damage to reputation. If counsel is saying that we are trying to prove the damage to reputation, that's got nothing to do with the hearsay rule. These people on the panel discussion were not talking about that. They were talking about his mental health. The court, I will overrule the objection. Open court. Mr. Shooter, you testified that the convention you are about to tell us about took place after the publication of the statements by Mr. Ellison in issue number 53. The court. He hasn't stated that yet, but suppose you ask him a question. Marshall, when in relation to the time when issue 53 came out, was it that this convention took place? It took place the following summer. So then if the issue, Journal 53, came out in February of 1980, is it correct that the convention took place in the summer of 1980? I believe in July, yes. Can you tell us what was said, what was discussed at the panel discussion? Yes. As I said, uh, the title was Morality in Comics. Mark Avenier was the moderator. He opened with a statement condemning Michael Fleischer and his work and the very idea that someone who wrote that's the sort of things that Michael wrote uh, would be allowed to do so. He continued on that for a while, and then he turned it over to the panel for comments and discussion. What followed uh, then was they took turns, starting with Marv Wolfman and working their way down the row. Marv carried on kind of a general condemnation uh, and said that people like that should not be allowed to do work for public consumption. Len Wein amplified that. Scott Shaw sort of condemned the idea of anything but funny animal comics in general. <laughs> <laughs> Al Hartley didn't know Michael, didn't know his work, but but he what he said was, well, uh, if all if all what they were saying was true, then he certainly agreed with them that the sort of thing shouldn't be allowed to go on. Sharman Devona, also I don't think was terribly familiar with Michael or his work. She mostly talked about what she thought about what comics should be and B. Clyburn was the only dissenting voice. He thought it was wrong to discuss someone like that who wasn't there to defend themselves. He called them Nazis and book burners. Did the panel discuss Michael Fleischer's mental health or mental or psychological stability? Yes. What did they say about that? They said he was sick and twisted and crazy. Did anyone on the panel give a basis or reference for his statements? I don't remember any exact quotes of reference. I don't remember anyone waving a copy of the comics journal. Uh, during the discussion, the interview was mentioned. Have you had conversations with distributors in the industry about the problem of selling Michael Fleischer's name on works? Yes, I have. Can you tell us with whom you've had such discussions and what was said? Well, as I said, it's my business to pursue this sort of thing in a general way. I've had to more or less uh, pointed discussions about Michael Fleischer with distributors. Who was the distributor? Name one of the distributors. The first time I had the discussion was with Phil Suling. The second time was with Chuck Rosansky, man. That's Mile High Comics, baby. Who is Phil Suling? Phil Suling, actually at the time, he was one of the largest distributors in the direct market. He more or less is the man who founded the direct market distribution system. His company was called Seagate and was one of the largest distributors. Phil also ran a very, very large convention in New York City. What did Mr. Suling say insofar as it affected Michael Fleischer's saleability? Phil, uh, the occasion was at his convention and some artists were organizing a support Michael Fleischer thing where they were going to sell pictures, drawings, and raise money for Michael. Phil had agreed to that at first, apparently, but then I think when he found out that it was uh, really, that it was really 
what it was really about, he objected. Uh, those people came to me as a person in authority. The artist came to me figuring that as a person in authority, I would be best to talk to Phil. I spoke to him and he told me his point of view on the subject. What did Mr. Soling say? He didn't think it was appropriate for any support of Michael. He told me basically that he was pretty much believed uh, what had been said in the interview and that he thought things were uh, fine just the way they were. Was he any more specific about what he believed? I can't quote him word for word, but the substance of it was that he did not wish to support any help to Michael because he had essentially felt that the journal and that what Harlan Ellison said was okay, uh, that it was correct. What was the conversation you had with the other distributor? Chuck Rosansky uh, from Alternate Realities and Mile High Comics in Denver. We spoke about writers in general. I had a discussion with him about, you know, who was hot, who was not. We talked about the effect on sales on the number of different writers who are currently working, as I usually do, as is my job to do. When I mentioned the name Michael Fleischer, he thought Michael was not someone who would have a positive impact on sales. He thought he was better than some and not as good as others in terms of impact on sales. I don't think Chuck really cares about the quality of work. Uh, that's not fair to say. We were speaking in reference to sales. At any rate, he asked me if, uh, if this had to do with this hearing. And I said, well, in general, I need to know this. And yes, uh, it happens to be that I'm going to be deposed and that and about this. And, and so he added that, uh, this is a quote within a word or two, that there's no question that the interview did Michael uh, terrible damage and that this his sellability is much less now uh, as a result of what happened. No further questions. The court. Mr. Norwick? Norwick. I wonder if I could presume to suggest a morning break or do you want me to continue? The court. Ladies and gentlemen, we will take a mid-morning recess. Cross-examination is going to begin uh, on, on the next episode. This is exciting. This is new to the cartoonist kayfabe courtroom cases. Because it, it's a real courtroom. It's not It's not just a bunch of millionaires sitting in a room talking to each other and getting into minutia. Like we're, we're in front of a jury, a jury of the peers. Uh, man, the way that these like, there's, it's just not never a good look, these depositions, because you clearly have stake in the game. So you're going to add a little color to your answers and stuff like that to like push a narrative. And when you read it like this, probably no matter who it is, it's slimy to me. It feels gross. I agree with you. That That's something that's, uh, that I've been feeling as we've started reading these more in depth. And uh, it's kind of a peculiar phenomena. And it because we're identifying it, I feel like I distance myself a little bit from the judgment of the people who are, are giving their depositions because it is a really strange, like, you know, I imagine how I would answer these questions. Um, in this case, I'd have almost no point of view, but, you know, trying to explain comics and the way comics work to people that, you know, are, are looking at it from a legal basis and have no connection to the industry. It's just odd, you know, it's almost um, alien language or something, you know, to describe this thing that we talk about all the time. It's I do perfect. love some of the details, though, like whether it's a little bit of Phil Soling being the guy who invented the, the direct market system or the specific example of uh, Barry Windsor Smith's fill-in issue selling double the, the, the normal issues through comic book shops. Um, that's pretty amazing. The other thought that I came away with as we kept reading this, we mentioned um, in the beginning, 12 million copies uh, distributed, 8 million sold. And I'm trying to figure out, I wonder where the break point is. I forget what year it is when the direct market overtakes newsstands. It I might think, be 1986 yeah, where they're like the, the even. Word. So if that's the case, you assume 4 million of the 8 million sales are comic book shops, 4 million are newsstand. And that goes back to that 50-50 split we mentioned earlier about newsstands where it's like, you're sending out two issues and you're selling one of them. And that's, that's kind of the business model for the newsstand distribution to illustrate what a difference it is like no wonder every every publisher ran after the uh the the direct market once that became a possibility i mean you know your your profit just skyrockets you know your books are basically becoming twice as profitable because you're selling every single copy as, a, as opposed to selling half the copies another interesting piece of this is like at what point do uh these editors get into a position of like blackballing uh, people because they're talking about the sellability of the creator, yada, yada. And 
at one point, like, is there a general consensus idea that is formed independently that this person is not sellable? So they don't get to make comics anymore. Or are these editors talking and uh, just shunning somebody out of a business? Another illuminating piece, uh, getting back to like that Barry Windsor Smith doubling his the sales of that book is the discovery that of something I didn't know that the editors get participation in these books selling uh, makes me wonder like, I sure hope they get that now, but it doesn't seem like it then because rather than just like match up really cool creative teams, they're going like some other way with, with like weird stunt casting to try to get a quick blip or something. Um, different business, but still some of the same some of the same issues. Yeah, I mean, my favorite part of these depositions so far is just all the comics history under oath. Like that—that that really is the 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 insightful thing. I, I didn't know about editors being part of the incentive plan at this point either. Um, I have no idea how they line up with incentives in today's world, for that matter. But it's great to just—I mean, it's it's another piece of the puzzle, and you can see how that would do all kinds of stuff, you know, I mean, that would make freelancers sort of really uh, try to incur favor from these editors. Um, you know, it's just a whole different thing. Like now you're playing politics behind trying to make good comics. You know, there's also like the clicky politics and I got to get in with the ex editors. Um, you know, like there would be all these different places that you're jockeying for. And I, I don't know whether that's good or bad. It's a new thing for me to think about, you know, but it definitely adds like more intrigue to the whole, an industry that's full of horror stories. This is like a little bit more incentive for everybody to just do terrible stuff to, to try to curry favor from, from editorial to freelancers, like going both directions. As a, as a creative, also, by the way, all that Jim Shooter, the, the company is the author kind of talk. Work for hire, you, man. How do you jobbers feel about that good stuff right there, man? Also, that is legal. That's legal. You know, I mean, like that's the legal uh, point of view for work for hire. Like literally what work for hire means is like, you're not the creator. Yeah. The company is the creator legally. And, and I, I guess like, like when we get into the, the jobber discussions just on the channel or whatever, uh, a big sort of definition for me of that is the freelance work for hire person who is acting like an employee rather than as a person who runs their own business, that's, that's in a nutshell, the jobber mentality. Like you are not an employee of that company. When, when, uh, when they're trying to get together unions, the creatives ain't involved with that part. Like you are running your own business, but you are bending the knee, pretending to be an employee and you don't even get health insurance. Like that's, that's the jobber thing, man. And, uh, and, and that's a fascinating piece. Also, if you are in that system and you're working with an editor who is sp the spearhead of, say, we'll just say five titles, and you're not getting much attention, much love from that editor, that editor is probably dealing with the, with the, the prettier ponies, man, who are going to bring him some, some, some royalties. I got another one for who they might be dealing with. They might be dealing with the troubled creator, the book that's late, the, the book that's always a problem. This is like teachers have this, right? The, yeah. the, the, the kid that is a problem gets a disproportionate amount of attention and time. You know, you only have so much of these resources if you're the editor. And so the book that is, who knows, suffering from something, that's going to just like necessitate that editor's attention. You know, like in some cases, you're just putting out fires to try to keep, if you've got five books, keep those trains running on time. Like there's any number of reason why the editor's attention would not be towards making the best comic book possible. Um, and, you know, it's probably the norm. It's not, it's not the unusual, it's not the odd time that it's like, oh, that month I had to focus on a late book. I bet you it's most of the time is like just trying to get these books in on time if you're the editor. You see that in a lot of documentaries. I'm thinking about like the 2001 documentary or a uh... No, 2000 AD documentary, The British Mag. Rule one, get the book on time. Two, try to make something that's kind of cool. But, you know, when you're booking time at the print facilities, you got to pay your either way because you're booking time there. So if you're late, like you're costing the company money. And as a creative, they're not going to put up with that very much, man. So they got to get these books in, get us something. If you got to do a snow blind issue, 
just put some panels in a gimmick, man, do what you got to do, but we got to print these things. Yeah. It's, it's real interesting stuff. Um, you know, the wrestling version of this is, uh, the best ability is availability. You know, these guys who look like a million bucks, but are injured or they're late or they're undependable. It doesn't help you if they're not there. Like you need the guy that, that you can count on. It's going to be there uh, every night in the case of wrestling. And uh, in the case of these books, like it's, it's part of the reason that, you know, people want to complain and I'll pull out Vince Coletta's name. People want to complain about, they don't like his inking or that he eliminated figures or whatever he did that, you know, gets on the blacklist. But what he did do was brought the pages in on time. You know, if he had pages due Tuesday in your Marvel, you're getting those pages on Tuesday. And that's a priority. Whenever this is the system, that's a priority. And, you know, that's a priority that trumps everything else. Uh, creativity, unique voice, whatever criteria we might value. That's not the value if you have time reserved on the printing press. Like you're paying for that time either way. Very well said, Jimmy. I guess we'll get into some cross-examinations on uh, on the next episode. Uh, K Fabers, I do want to implore you if you got hold of any cool depositions, if you got the the wherewithal to hit the Pacer website and and come forth with some documents, send them our way. Uh, this is incredibly instructive. Learning a lot, uh, learning a lot about the history of comics by way of these depositions. Learning a lot about how how the people at the sort of top of the game kind of run their businesses and how they see that these businesses are run good information to put out into the world, man. And I think that uh, that is in evidence by just the audience that's showing up every Monday for these, these videos, man. But, you know, we have more depositions to get through more Jim Shooter specifically there's Harlan Ellison, Gary Groth, Dean Mullaney uh, depositions regarding this case alone. And uh, we, we have a Stan Lee on, on a future docket that, that we're going to get into that's i believe in relation to jack kirby yeah this is this is great stuff i'm so excited for the next piece of this deposition where we get to switch the uh when we get to see cross i'm, yes. I'm excited to see cross <laughs> see man we're involved in jargon now man should we get out of here jimmy <laughs> yes okay favors like follow subscribe to the youtube channel hit the bell we'll notify you when new vids are available jimmy what's out there bro or what's going to be out there in the nearest future? Hulk Grand Design, all Hulk Grand Design. Tell your comic shops about it. Tell your comic book friends about it. Uh, and join my Patreon, patreon.com slash Jim Rug, where I'll be posting in-process shots, artwork, notes, uh, behind the scenes, answering questions. Um, it's all Hulk Grand Design for me, Ed, for the, for the foreseeable future. And uh, I couldn't be more excited about that. I'd like to see 100,000 of those things or more get sold, man, so that you could get dip into the uh, incentive uh Pool, <laughs> yes man. that's exactly right i would love to be able to report on how their royalty program works uh, oh don't say hand. the r word it's oh, an right, incentive right, right. like even <laughs> in the deposition shooters like i have to be very precise here because he accidentally said the r word and when you look in the fucking language of these marvel contracts and stuff it's incentive because they're doing you a kindness and they don't have to do this shit man it's real fucked up very anyhow, true <laughs> anyhow man red room the anti-social network out on stands right now uh scoop it up man not going to be on the stands for much longer and uh with these paper shortages the reprint might take a while to hit the stand so if you see it don't take it for granted scoop the book up hit up amazon do what you got to do uh red room trigger warnings issue number one is going to be hitting the stands in february six weeks pushed back because of those paper shortages uh the orders were cut off early also because of diamonds ransomware attack because some intern opened up a detachment or something god damn it and uh, the which results in uh, scarcer orders than uh, what was uh, possible because of it getting cut a couple of weeks ahead of time. So that's going to be a scarce issue. Number one, get this thing put on your pool list, get it uh, wherever you can get it. Jimmy and I have link trees in the description below this video where you can pre order these comics, you can hit up our Patreons. What else do we have out there, Jim? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter also at the links below this video. And you can find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. Give them those marching orders, man. We're going to be on our way. Make more comics. And get your story straight when you appear on the stands.